Where do our attitudes come from? In this set of PowerPoint slides, we're going to talk about the different ways in which attitudes get formed. Specifically, we're going to talk about classical conditioning. We're going to talk about operant conditioning. We're going to talk about observational learning. And we're also going to talk about self-perception. Let me first talk about classical conditioning, but then very quickly move into something a little more specific, vicarious classical conditioning, which seems to be an important underlying cause of a great many of our uh, attitudes. Now, if you'll recall, classical conditioning occurs when a stimulus out there in the world that has previously been neutral, uh, like a bell for a dog, uh, gets paired with something that automatically elicits a response from the organism like a piece of meat for the dog. So you're all familiar with Pavlov's classical conditioning procedures, where a piece of meat and a bell are presented at the same time, and the dog salivates when it uh, sees the meat. But after a while, it begins to salivate uh, just by hearing the bell, because the bell has been paired with the meat. In this situation, the meat is called the unconditioned stimulus, the bell is called the conditioned stimulus. The unconditioned stimulus is the thing that we automatically respond to. The conditioned stimulus is the thing that we learn to respond to because it's been associated with the unconditional stimulus. And the response that we give in response to the conditioned stimulus after conditioning has occurred is called the conditioned response. So, what is vicarious classical conditioning? In order to talk about this, let's consider a specific example. It's no secret that a lot of people have a very strong fear or phobia even about snakes and spiders and various other creepy crawly things. And yet, most people have not had any really direct experience with these kinds of animals that would make us so afraid of them. So where do these attitudes come from? Well, a lot of these attitudes that we seem to have no explanation for why we hold them uh, have been formed through the process of vicarious classical conditioning. And let's use the snake phobia as an example. Imagine a little boy, um, maybe only a year and a half old, uh, goes out for a walk with his mother one day. While they're out walking, a snake kind of comes along, slithers across the sidewalk. Now for the little boy, this is the first snake he's ever seen and he doesn't have any feelings about it one way or the other because it just it's a neutral stimulus. But at that moment, the mother screams, gets very tense, runs away dragging the little boy with her. The mother's extreme emotional upset uh, is for the child a very powerful stimulus. The child becomes afraid then. So the emotional response of the mother becomes an unconditioned stimulus that's paired with the conditioned stimulus of the snake. So they go out walking again a few days later, same thing happens. Snake comes along, mother freaks, freaks out and starts screaming, scares the little boy again. Well, eventually, when the little boy sees a snake, even if the mother is not there, he'll respond with fear because he's been classically conditioned uh, to be afraid of the snake. It's called vicarious classical conditioning because we're being conditioned through the response of another person. So in vicarious classical conditioning, the unconditioned stimulus is always the emotional response of another person. So vicarious classical conditioning is still classical conditioning. It's not a very, it's not a completely different process but there is a specific kind of unconditioned stimulus that operates there. So next time you start thinking about your snake phobias, give some thought to maybe how this came to be. So classical conditioning can probably explain the formation of a lot of the attitudes that we walk around with, be they um, racial prejudices, uh, fear of snakes, dislike of certain foods or types of movies, whatever it might be. Um, 
Classical conditioning could be the underlying process, but attitudes can also get formed in other ways as well. Through operant conditioning. Some of our attitudes we hold because we've been rewarded for holding them. Uh, recall that operant conditioning is what happens when responses are either punished or reinforced after they occur. So imagine um, a new person showing up at college, a new student wants to make friends, wants to be popular, and uh, they are having a conversation about music and uh, they express, um, you know, somebody asks them, well, what's your favorite band? And they, they give them an answer. And if everybody smiles and says, oh yeah, I love them too, that reinforces that attitude toward that band and will make it stronger and make the poor person hold it more firmly. On the other hand, if people kind of frown and look embarrassed or roll their eyes, that's a punisher and eventually that attitude may go away. So some of our attitudes get formed through this process of reward and punishment. We also learn attitudes by um, observation. We see what happens to other people when they express certain attitudes. So in the example I just used about musical preferences, maybe the individual, him or herself, is not the one that exp expressed a preference for a certain band, but they watched what happened when somebody else expressed this preference and took the message, okay, um, I see how people responded to that. I'm not going to share that attitude with anyone. Um, observational learning is uh, the basis of something called the theory of planned behavior, which you're reading about in the textbook. It basically says that uh, we not just learn our attitudes through other people, but attitudes can be the result of a conscious rational choice. Um, I decide to have a positive or negative attitude about something because I know that's going to lead to rewards. And finally, um, attitudes can be formed through the process of self-perception. In this case, attitudes aren't the things that cause behaviors. Attitudes are the things that result following a behavior. We're going to talk a little more about this later on in this module when we talk about cognitive dissonance theory, but a very short version of it is that uh, you watch your own behavior and from your behavior, you infer what your attitude must be. If I see myself uh, picking up trash and recycling things, I conclude I must have a pro-environmental attitude. It's not the attitudes that's causing the behavior, it's the behavior that's uh, working in, a, in reverse. But we'll talk about that a little more. So it's not surprising that attitudes can be so difficult to change when you consider all of the different ways in which they come into being and all of the different directions from which they get propped up. 